broadcasting from Purple Earth. Hello, my name is Abby, and I'm going to talk to you about transportation liberation. This is a story that illustrates how my wife Rosie and I chose to live without a car. The story starts in 2001, when we were blessed with the chance to take two road trips of our dreams. In the summer, we loaded up our old Ford Ranger and took a loop through the western United States. We went through the Four Corners, the Grand Canyon, we went the entire length of the West Coast, and then we came back home through Yellowstone and we went to a lot of other cool places in between. Right in the middle of biker season. We were seduced by the great American dream of the open road to sit back and watch the countryside roll by under our seats, to put on the music and breathe in how vast it all is. But the reality is one of crowded roads, traffic, exhaust, and stress. Let's hear the sounds of stress. I wanna get out of town. Me too. We were stressed out because our truck turned out to be a 5,000 pound burden. We had to feed it gas, we had to deal with breakdowns and repairs, and often it was next to impossible to find a place to put the thing. So in the fall, we spent two months touring a big chunk of Europe, and we got to experience life in a lot of places that we had only seen in other people's photographs. What made this trip so much different from the first was our method of travel. Yes, we had to fly to get across the pond and back, but the rest of our trip was spent living out of backpacks and riding on trains, and coaches, and ferries, and we made good use of public transit to get around in bigger cities. But travel time was for lounging, and cuddling, and sleeping, and eating, and writing, and reading, or working, or just gazing out the window at the scenery. All stuff that you cannot do while driving. So this story is about what we learned from the dramatic contrast between these two odysseys. It's about the contrast between transportation being done wrong and transportation being done right. It's about the difference between having our eyes locked onto the road all the time or dreamily watching our shadow through the window. It's between living two months in and centered on our car and then spending another two months discovering a life where our car was not part of our reality at all. And we never felt weighed down by our packs. In fact, we felt liberated from the burden of our truck. It wasn't long after that that we became car free and it turned out to be one of the smartest things that we've ever done. Because now we're free from the need to keep throwing money into our car. We're free from paying for gas and oil and tires and repairs. No more bills for registration or insurance. We're free from the stress of driving, and now we live much more active and healthy lives. But being car free is best if we all can do it. Because then we can become free from noise and pollution. We can be free from having to build and maintain more and more and bigger and bigger highways and bridges. Instead, we can opt for more human-friendly design. It's a lot cheaper to build and maintain, easier and safer to navigate, much nicer to look at, and gentler on the environment. Most important is what not driving does to our social fabric. When we interact face to face, human to human, we're much nicer to each other than we are when we're inside of steel shells. And this leads to more cohesive communities. So in short, transportation liberation makes us a richer, healthier, happier people living in cleaner, quieter, friendlier neighborhoods. This program is gonna talk about the whys of not driving, the hows of not driving, which start with driving less, and finally, what we all can do today to get closer to transportation liberation. The whys of not driving are spelled out in the subtitle of this show. Save money, save the planet, save your sanity. We'll look at each of these in detail, starting with saving the planet. 
These days, when people think about what driving does to the planet, they think about global warming. But there are a lot of other ways that driving does damage to the planet. But since everybody's thinking about global warming, we'll look at that first. For those of you who don't already know, a big cause of global warming is all the extra carbon dioxide, all that CO2 that we're putting into the atmosphere. What you see here is me holding a five pound canister of CO2. We use it to keep our beer keg charged up, and that little bottle of gas will last us about three or four half barrels. If I opened up the valve and let all the gas out, there's about enough to fill a small closet. This is a two gallon can of gasoline. When we burn it in our motors, each gallon becomes, among other things, 20 pounds of CO2. So this two gallon can of gas is equivalent to 40 pounds, eight of those canisters of CO2. But we burn a lot of gas. Every year, we use 22 billion gallons of gasoline in America, and Americans burn 40 billion gallons of diesel fuel. I wanted to know what this much fuel would look like, so I did some math and I figured out how deep each tank, hypothetical fuel tank, containing a year's worth of fuel would be if it were a mile in diameter. The gasoline tank that you see on the left is 135 feet deep. And on the right, you see the diesel tank, and that's 250 feet deep. And what we're looking at here is what these two hypothetical tanks would look like in Portland. Now the problems with fuel are not limited to burning it. Before fuel can be burned, it has to be refined. And refining is a dirty, obscene, gross process. In fact, for every 15 gallon tank of gas, another gallon gets burned at the refinery. Then there's the impact of the entire transportation infrastructure. Crude oil has to get from the wells to the refineries. It goes through a vast international network of pipelines and super tankers. Then it has to get to our local gas stations through yet another insane network of pipelines, storage terminals, and trucking fleets. Murphy's Law has enforced itself with devastating results in that anything that can go wrong has gone wrong and will continue to go wrong. When we buy gasoline, this is the industry that we're subsidizing. So, you might be thinking that we should save gas by driving hybrid cars, or run them on ethanol, or biodiesel, or even electricity. The problem with using alternative fuels as an excuse to keep on driving the way that we drive now, it won't solve a lot of the fundamental problems caused by driving. And any problems that are solved will be done by creating new problems some of which we're seeing already. For example, think about this the next time you fill your gas tank. If you were to fill your tank with straight ethanol or maybe E85, that one tank of fuel uses enough grain to feed a person for a year. I looked up yield expectations and conversion factors and I did some more math. To replace a year's worth of gasoline with ethanol, we would need 57,000 square miles of corn. Now the yellow box on the map represents the 57,000 square miles of prime corn growing real estate that we would have to sacrifice for this endeavor. It doesn't leave that much corn for food. Now to fill the bigger tank, the diesel tank, we need to grow 900,000 square miles of soybeans. Now the software that I use to draw a picture of a hypothetical 900 mile by 1,000 mile soybean field doesn't compensate for the curvature of the earth, so that's why it looks a little weird there. I also need to point out that the fuel from this field is only enough to replace the diesel that we use on the highways, in 18-wheelers, buses, motorhomes, and so forth. It does not include what we use for farm machinery, railroad locomotives, construction and mining equipment, generators, and all these other things in which we burn diesel fuel. Mining is something that we subsidize anytime we buy a car, especially a new car. Minerals have to be dug out of the ground, hauled to a mill, and then a lot of energy gets expended to turn rocks and dirt into usable metals. And you can't process all that steel that we need to build our cars without burning lots of coal. The car manufacturing plants themselves are sprawling, power-hungry complexes with thousands of arc welding stations and lots and lots of high-performance power tools. Building the roads themselves has an unbelievable carbon footprint, and it comes from cement. There's a ton of CO2 released 
for every ton of cement produced. And we use 470 metric tons of cement per mile per lane on American highways. Embedded in that concrete slab that we call a lane mile are 59 metric tons of steel. That's the web of rebar used to reinforce the concrete. Blacktop, cheap substitute for concrete, but it's a smelly, tarry petroleum product. Most people want their potholes filled, but they don't want one of these in their neighborhood. So, burning fuel is bad for the planet. Getting the fuel we burn is bad for the planet. Building the cars that burn the fuel is bad for the planet. And building the highways that our cars drive on is bad for the planet. All of that should be reason enough to not drive. But for some people, it's not reason enough. But saving money, that gets just about anybody's attention. Let's look at how much it costs to drive. The cost of driving goes far beyond the cost of gas. We found a total cost of ownership calculator at the Edmunds.com website. You tell it where you live, what kind of car you're thinking of buying, and it comes back with a whole spreadsheet estimating the cost to drive that car for five years. So looking for cheap driving options, I went there and chose a 2003 Toyota Corolla delivered to La Crosse, where insurance rates are a lot less. I averaged out the numbers over five years, took fuel out of the picture for now, and came up with a bottom line of about $3,400 a year, or $283 a month. Now that's the cost of ownership alone, does not include what we pay for the fuel we burn or what we pay for parking. If I were to drive that car 20 miles to work and back every day at 35 miles a gallon, your mileage may vary, it'll cost about $95 a month for gas. So anyway, the total driving expenses in this frugal scenario are about $378 per month. And while we're talking about driving expenses, I have to mention parking. An average car is parked for 95% of its life, and we always have to pay for our parking in one way or another. One part of the parking expense is parking tickets, which in some places are almost inevitable. So anyway, in some places, the total cost of parking can run into triple digits every month. So for comparison, I whipped up this little calculator of expenses that you might have in a year of the non-driving lifestyle. Now in our world, these are living large numbers. What we actually spend is a lot less than this. And it all comes up to a little bit over $100 a month to live large, not driving, which compares pretty well next to $378 for the frugal driving lifestyle. So think of all the cool things that you could do with way over $200 a month or over $3,200 a year. So anyway, that's the direct personal financial cost of driving. We still have to consider the public cost of driving, what we all pay through our taxes for roads and bridges and stuff like that. First, we're going to have a little sidebar diversion, another visualization exercise. What does a billion dollars look like? We all know what a hundred dollar bill looks like, even if we don't get to handle one often enough. A billion dollars is 10 million hundred dollar bills. If you had a thousand hundred dollar bills, that'd be a stack of C notes 4.3 inches high, a hundred grand. That's a lot of money to leave on the table. Now 10 of those bundles is a million dollars, the proverbial suitcase full of hundred dollar bills. 10 of those bundles, $10 million, a big trunk full of money. 10 of those is $100 million, a couple of very heavy pallets. 10 of those is a billion dollars, enough $100 bills to stuff into a small room. $1 billion is a stack of $100 bills, 12 feet long, 7 feet high, and almost 5 feet wide. So remember what $1 billion looks like when we start talking about some of these numbers. According to the Federal Highway Administration, every year Americans spend $153 billion to pay for roads. On top of that, Greenpeace did a study in 1995 and came up with $25 billion as the annual cost of routine military protection of the oil supply. Now in 2008, I would regard that as a conservative number. 
Then there's also the cost of trying to steal oil, mainly the Iraq war. Three trillion dollars, spread that out over 30 years, it's still a hundred billion dollars a year. So altogether, our tax dollars are subsidizing driving to the tune of $288 billion a year. So you might say, well, we pay for roads with our gas taxes and registration fees and stuff. Kinda, not quite. We only collect $90 billion in gas taxes and registration fees every year. That leaves $198 billion not paid for. So it's paid for through other taxes. I think it's what the wonks call general revenue. What this means is that whether we drive or not, every man, woman, and child in this country is paying $55 a month to subsidize the national driving addiction. Or we could raise the gas tax by $3.19 a gallon. And I'm not sure how much gas people would buy if it were $7 a gallon. So driving is very expensive, but not in terms of money alone. It's also expensive in terms of our time. There was a nationwide survey done a few years ago commissioned by ABC News that studied driving habits, and it found that we spend an average of 104 minutes a day driving if we have kids living at home. Those of us without kids at home average only 77 minutes a day behind the wheel. What this means is that each week we use the equivalent of an extra workday driving, eight and two-thirds hours for those of us with kids at home, or six and a half hours for the rest of us. Think of all the cool things you could do with all that extra time. Driving takes a high price on our health, mainly because the driving lifestyle is a sedentary lifestyle. Walking is what our bodies are designed to do, and our health suffers if we don't do enough of it, or at least get enough of some sort of exercise. Another health issue is that if you're in the middle of a parking lot of idling cars, the air quality is going to suck no matter how good your air filters are. Another health hazard is road rage. We've all been exposed to road rage. In fact, most of us have probably committed road rage at one time or another. When we're driving, we're hassled, we're stressed out, and we're stir crazy. So the driving lifestyle is not only bad for our physical health, it's also bad for our emotional health and our mental health. And on top of all that, you never know when driving might bring you to a place like this or even to a place like this. Right now, Americans, very rightly so, are ticked off because over the past five years, over 4,000 service people have been killed in the Iraq war. But every year, 43,000 people are killed on our highways, and 2.7 million people are injured in crashes. So by not driving, we save the planet, we save money, we save time, we save our sanity, and we may even save our very lives. But how do we possibly function without driving? One thing that this question made me think of is this survey that we had to fill out for a conference we were registering for. And these surveys always ask, you know, what little, subtype, what, what little subtopics might be of interest to you? One that sort of jumped, up, jumped out at us and grabbed our attention was the history of the car-free movement. And I thought, come on, the history of the car-free movement is actually all of human history prior to 1900. Civilization thrived for thousands of years without cars. I learned how to live car-free from my grandmother, and I never even knew it until years after she was gone. My grandparents never owned a car in their lives, but they made out okay. They lived right in town. It was a small town. And they walked to work, they'd walk to the grocery store, they'd walk to church, my mother walked to school. Everything they needed was within walking distance. And every little town had, at the very least, a bus that came through once a day. So if you can't get anywhere that you need to go without a car, you should seriously consider moving as an important part of your transportation liberation strategy. In the meantime, every time you're about to embark on a drive, especially a short one, ask yourself, how can I get there without driving? Once you know how to get there without driving, you have a way to not drive, and you should not drive. So how do we get there without driving? The most obvious answer is to walk the first pillar of transportation liberation. 
Walking is how we've gotten around since the dawn of time, and we can cover a lot more territory on foot than we give ourselves credit for. Walking speed is about three or four miles an hour, so that means a mile is only 15 or 20 minutes. So I'd say it's fair to say that anything up to a mile and a half is within reasonable walking distance. Nobody wants to hang out around traffic, so community planners need to make walking easy, and the places we walk have to be pleasant. If we can do that, then that'll encourage people to walk more, and we'll be healthier and happier as a society. Don't look tired we now. Should, we should look really fit. Exactly. The invention of the wheel helped extend our range by quite a bit. Which brings us to the second pillar of transportation liberation, the most efficient application of human power we know of, the bicycle. A steady commuting pace is about 10 or 15 miles an hour. So depending on hills, a reasonable commuting range is about three to five miles. If you already have a good bike that you use for exercise, start using it as a way to get around without driving. You probably don't want to ride on the same roads that you would normally drive on. What we like to do is we'll use a dedicated bike route when we can find one. Otherwise, we'll find some bike-friendly side streets. And if you have the right clothing and the right gear, you can ride a bike in any weather. Another advantage with bikes is parking. In this Copenhagen neighborhood, there's a well-placed horizontal bar mounted to the wall of this building for the entire block. It provides lots of safe and accessible parking that the car people could never even dream of. Near European train stations, we'd often see literally thousands of bikes. What commuters do is they would own two bikes, and they'd keep one at the station where they live, and then they'd keep another one at the station where they work. The third pillar of transportation liberation is public transit. We can move people much more efficiently if, instead of one or two people per vehicle, we can transport dozens or hundreds of people per vehicle. Most of us are familiar with the most common form of public transit, the diesel bus. We're going to take a quick little tour of some of the other public transit that we've seen. One improvement on the diesel bus is the electric bus. The Muni in San Francisco has been using these for generations, powered by electric wires hanging over the street. The next improvement is streetcars and trams. If you have a steel wheel running on a steel rail, it gives you a lot less rolling resistance than you have with a rubber wheel on asphalt. So that makes streetcars and trams a very efficient way to move lots of people. In San Francisco on Market Street, they've been running vintage streetcars up and down for years because it illustrates how this technology has been around for a long time. They even used to pull them with horses. And San Francisco has kept their system up to date with up-to-date equipment and well-maintained tracks over the years, just still benefiting over a century later from this, from this system that they've built. We were in Prague and we saw this funicular running up and down the hill and we thought, wow, that looks cool. We got to check this out. The funicular is interesting. It's, it's two cars cabled together and the car going down the hill helps pull the other car going up the hill. When one of the cars is stopped at the station, both of them have to stop and then they pass each other in the middle. This is at the BART station in Berkeley, California, and it shows how you can take your, your bike onto the train. What you have to do is you bring your bike inside the gate and park it in there, and then you have to go back out through the gate and walk through the turnstile with your ticket, and then go back and get your bike and wait for your train down on the platform. Uh, when I first started using this, it was $2 for your lifetime, and I'm told that it's free now to get a bike pass for the BART. And then, of course, to leave the station, you have to feed your ticket back through the turnstile. Um, an interesting thing about the BART is that in 1989, they had a huge earthquake in the Bay Area, and it destroyed a lot of the highway infrastructure. Um, freeways collapsed. The Bay Bridge was closed for over a month. The only way to get across the Bay was on the BART, because the BART 
including the Trans Bay tube running on the bottom of the bay, was virtually undamaged, reopened the next day. And finally, we have to hand it to the Swiss, because they're able to get people anywhere they need to go with public transportation in a very topographically challenging country. So eventually you might get to the point that you don't need your car very often at all anymore. And that's the point that you can sell it and truly become car free. But that doesn't mean that you're doomed to a life of sitting still. For instance, if you miss that last bus that can get you to the train station on time, you can still call a cab. See, we don't need to own a car as long as we know we can get access to a car when we need one. So what we do is we rent a car three to five weekends a year and that still costs less than the cost of car insurance alone. A lot of cities have community car programs. This one is in Madison. It's another method of providing access to a car for people who don't need one very often. The membership and the usage fees are a lot less than the cost of owning a car, and these services can make a variety of vehicles available to a lot of people. We're big fans of piggybacking. If you bring your bike with you to the city, you can use it for running those short errands or exploring the neighborhoods without hassling with your car. And then if you're out on the highway, it's good to have it along just in case you break down in the middle of nowhere. That makes the nearest gas station a lot closer than it would be otherwise. In La Crosse and a lot of other cities, you can piggyback on the bus using these bike racks that we call Herber racks for reasons that I'll explain later. You fold the rack down, put your bike on the rack, and you get to save your energy for riding to the places that the bus won't go. The Max in Portland, just like the BART in San Francisco and a lot of other systems, let you piggyback your bike on the train. And you can even bring your bike on a lot of Amtrak trains. So how do we get home with a week or two worth of groceries if we don't own a car? With the right bags, you'd be amazed at how much you can carry on the bus. And as far as using pedal power to haul a load, even a four-year-old can figure that one out. We have three trailers in our fleet. This is our first trailer. It's a kitty trailer that we modified to haul cargo, and it's enough to handle our, almost our biggest shopping trips. Recently, we invested in an eight-foot trailer built by an outfit in Iowa called Bikes at Work. Right here, I'm loading up about 200 pounds of dry goods and groceries from a big bulk order that we did at our co-op. We saw this rig at the Midwest Renewable Energy Fair in Wisconsin, tooling around the grounds collecting recyclables. In the Christiania Enclave of Copenhagen, they have this bike called the Christiania bike. It's a push cart on the front, powered by a bicycle from the behind. And generally, it's mostly used to haul kids and groceries. You can get these covers for them. It makes them look like a little covered wagon, you know, but it keeps your kids dry and it keeps your groceries dry. Now, as for long distance traveling, we prefer to travel by train. It's much faster than driving, much more comfortable, less of a hassle than flying, nowhere near as claustrophobic as riding the bus. And in most cities, the station is right in the heart of downtown. The cool thing about the train is that you don't see signage and billboards screaming at you when you look out the window. Sometimes you're looking at back alleys or industrial zones, but other times you get this absolutely stunning scenery right in your face. The other thing is that you're always moving. When you're eating, you're moving. When you're sleeping, you're moving. When you're going to the bathroom, you're moving. I mean, we just love trains because they're so energy efficient and stress-free. Driving is an addiction in many ways. So for those of you who are still dependent, still addicted to driving, I'm gonna suggest a four-step program for your driving addiction. The four steps toward transportation liberation are, drive less. Start transitioning to the alternatives to driving. Try them out, get to learn them, use them more often. Reduce and eliminate your dependence on driving. And then once you've eliminated your dependence on driving, you can sell your car. So, if you're car dependent, if you're a driving addict, 
your first step toward transportation liberation is to drive less. And that's not as hard as you might think. I was once part of an intentional community with 30 members. And even though we lived 60 miles from the nearest city, I think collectively we drove less than 30 random people chosen from mainstream society because we only drove the van into town once a week to get a week's worth of supplies for 30 people. Now contrast that with the typical American habit of driving to the Quickie Mart constantly for every little thing. If the nearest bus stop or the nearest train station is too far away to walk or bike to it, then you can still start to drive less by driving only as far as the nearest transit connection, which will often be a park and ride. So keep looking for every way you can to not drive. Try commuting once a week without driving. Adapt to it. Start to do it more often. Walk around and get to know your neighborhood and your community on foot. Keep extending your range. Try riding a bike. Get it tuned up. Get it properly adjusted and get to know the best ways to get around your neighborhood on a bike. Get your local transit map or bus map. Get the schedules for the buses or trains that run through your neighborhood and to the places that you need to go. Learn how to read these maps and schedules. In most cities, you can get a PDF of maps and schedules online. Once you have the maps and the schedules, you can plan your trip and take it. Find out how car dependent you are by asking yourself what if questions. What happens if your car breaks down? What happens if it gets towed? What happens if it gets stolen? What if gas goes up another $3 a gallon? Will it cut your legs out from under you? Or can you still do what you need to do without missing a beat? If you're addicted to driving, keep resisting that addiction by finding ways to not drive, even if it means moving. Now, when it comes to not driving, there are limits on how much we can get done with our own initiative. We are going to need a lot of help from City Hall and all the other cathedrals of government. Our message to them, we shouldn't have to drive. Please make it easier for us to not drive. If we can make friends at City Hall, they can help us with the little things like traffic calming to make the neighborhoods more human friendly. They can help by designing and installing bike routes like this one in Copenhagen, where they put in an extra curb to protect the bike lane from the cars and trucks. In fact, the motorized traffic in Denmark seems rather sparse. We're told that this is because car ownership is expensive since it's so heavily taxed. Actually, it's just not heavily subsidized the way it is here. In Montreal, they built a network of bicycle highways by sacrificing traffic lanes or parking lanes. It gives the cyclists a relatively fast and unobstructed route through the city. And as a bonus, it calms the traffic around this park, being that they've taken a lane away. One problem with biking is that it's hard to trigger a traffic light. So in Boulder, Colorado, they solved that problem by giving the bike lane its own trigger. Driving addicts will complain, but we must devote more resources to building human-friendly communities where nobody needs to drive. Because when no one is driving, we won't need the roads to drive on. Then we can give the streets back to the people. One thing that always amazes us is how American Main Street business owners resist converting their streets to car-free zones. But then everywhere we go, we find the car-free places mobbed with people, walking up and down the streets, seeing and greeting each other, and all along the way, spending all kinds of money that American businesses just seem to be so afraid of. So the help we need from City Hall and from all of our government leaders and staff is to shift the point of view from which we design our communities. We must discourage driving and encourage not driving. And that can be done through the right engineering and the right tax policy. We have to keep evangelizing this vision to our transportation planners, the vision of how we can turn our communities into great places to live without the need to drive. As far as long distance transportation policy is concerned, let's just say that we need a lot fewer of these and a lot more of these. Now, if you're rational and if you're persistent, you can get things done. 
There actually are people just like us in city halls, county courthouses, state and federal office buildings all over the world who want to see good things happen, but they get caught up in the bureaucracy and they need that little extra push from the rest of us to get these kind of things validated. So I'm going to close with two stories of how one person can make a difference. Remember the bike racks on the buses and how we call them Herber racks? That's in honor of Dan Herber. He was a young car-free activist in La Crosse in the 90s. He was on the bike ped committee, got himself elected to city council, and one of his accomplishments was to get these bike racks installed on the buses. That one small accomplishment by one person continues to extend the range of bicyclists in La Crosse over a decade later. Another thing that La Crosse has is the, is the Stacy Pass. It gives all of the students at the State University, the Catholic University, and the Technical College free rides on all city buses. Your student ID is a bus pass. The way it works is that the MTU gets an annual flat fee paid for through student activity fees. It's called the Stacy Pass in honor of Stacy Boots. She was an energetic young student at the University of Wisconsin in La Crosse who had this idea and made the connections to get the student government, the university, and the MTU to all sign off on the deal. Now, Stacy's moved on to an exciting post-student life, but students in La Crosse still benefit from what Stacy got started. So any one of you can be a person who makes a difference, maybe in a way similar to what Dan Herber or Stacy Boots did, or maybe in some completely different way that better suits your style. No matter what you do, I hope you leave here today knowing that there's something more that you can do that you're not doing right now. Now there's a theory out there, I think it started in the science of computer climate modeling, it's called the butterfly effect. It says that the flapping of a butterfly's wings in China can affect tornadoes in Oklahoma. The point is that what may seem like the smallest and most insignificant of actions can have powerful reverberations. So even if you think your own personal effort is meaningless, a little can do a lot, especially if there are millions making the same effort. We all need to keep looking for ways to do more, to become more liberated, because we need to do a lot. Transportation liberation has transformed our lives. Not being car dependent has saved us thousands of dollars every year. Not owning a car at all has saved us hundreds more. We get more exercise, we deal with less stress, and we're just convinced that this way of life may add decades to our lives. And we're sure that transportation liberation can improve your life as well. And that's why we're here, to evangelize the transportation liberation lifestyle. So thanks for watching, and any questions, send them to www.purpleearth.net. Thank you. Broadcasting from Purple Earth. Burp.